Okay, so if you want now, uh, Professor uh, Lilik uh, present their experience in uh, flow diverter to treat the anebris. Uh, Dr. Lilik uh, work in Eneri Center in Hospital Sagrada Familia in Buenos Aires. Is the, the best the best neurointerventional in Latin America, also around the world, because I have many, many, many cases. Uh, you have I have a good uh, a good uh, experience with the with the flow diverter in giant and recent cavernous senos. Pedro, are you here? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody. Or oh, good after good afternoon in Madrid. Good uh, evening in uh, in China, probably. Uh, it's my pleasure to be uh, with you guys. Okay, whenever you want. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, Let's uh, share my screen. Hope you can see it. Uh, let me see. Okay. Probably you can see it now. Those are my disclosures already. Uh, I will share uh, my our experience in our endovascular center in, in Buenos Aires. It's an international center for training. Uh, I would like to acknowledge to all my team and especially all the, the fellows that I have or everywhere and especially to my fellow from China, Hongji. Uh, so uh, we must focus on the patient, of course. We know that we have a beautiful um, options, uh, surgeons. Uh, they develop fantastic options as already shown by Professor Erzmidi. Uh, we have uh, some uh, some things to, to to share with you from the endovascular uh, point of view. Uh, I think the terms complex is is exactly that some that we need. Those are fusiform dissecting, wide neck, blister like, uh, so are more than giant, uh, really. So I define uh, complex aneurysms those that are can be also large with exceptional wide necks, but for me meaning complex is a high morbidity and mortality, and particularly difficult in, in, in management of those complex. We know the natural history of those as very severe, 80% of the patient with symptomatic giant will be invalid or dead in five years. So this is a, a complex situation, especially because not only the, the aneurysm is complex, but uh, we're dealing with age or the arch, general condition like obesity, uh, some associated pathology like dysplasia or, or carotid disease. Uh, if, if you have a look on multifactorial origin of the aneurysm, uh, there are several things. Some are more important for us from the endovascular point of view, like, uh, like internal condition, as you see here. Uh, we share with the, with, the, with the microsurgery the condition of the walls. And I, I guess from, from microsurgery, probably the external conditions are more important. But as, as you have many different um, aneurysm patient, also you need different devices probably. So from the endovascular point of view, we have different devices for rupture or for unrupture. For rupture, we still favor coiling. For unrupture, we are most, uh, most and most doing uh, flow diversion. In Buenos Aires, we're still using coils, but as you see here, we more and more are using stent and flow diversion. Uh, we did our first stenting back in 1996 uh, because we understand that we have to reconstruct the, the artery, uh, trying to have circulatory exclusion uh, for those uh, aneurysms. So we start with coiling back in the 90. We are doing more and more flow diversion, flow disruption for those aneurysms, and nowadays we are having surface modification devices, as I will show you. Many devices on, on, on flow diversion, I will just show a couple of them. Uh, we are using that, that uh, flow diversion to reconstruct segmental disease. Why I mean by segmental disease? Well, uh, is what I have a damage in the, in the RTA that involves more than a quarter of the vessel circumference or the same distance and length. 
we are doing some kind of flow modulation through the through the RT to the aneurysm. Uh, as we can modify fluids on the on the beautiful fountain, water fountain, we also can do the same thing uh, with modifying uh, some flow conditions intervascularly. So this is a 51 year lady with a headache with a four aneurysms in a row. Uh, please pay attention to the proximal one. The ophthalmic arise from uh, from the base of the aneurysm. So what we are doing, if we implanted a flow diversion here, we make a channel inside uh, due, due to the some effect of the ophthalmic artery. Uh, you see, nine months after is, is the four, the three aneurysms are, are completely occluded, but there is one which remains open. What will happen if you follow those? And I I 100% I agree with Professor Herismini. We need to follow those patients. Uh, you see the, the progressive shrinking over the time, uh, but the, the ophthalmic, it remains completely open. So we remodeling the artery, but we keep the arteries uh, open. So this is, a, this is our beginning. And the second generation pipeline, long-term follow-up, nine years showing uh, the durability of those uh, giant uh, cavernous arteries. There's another case. Um, a seven years uh, follow up, a uh, nice remodeling of the artery, as you can see, um, and, and the, the metal is durable. So, we have an extensive experience with, um, with flow diversion, more than 1,700 patients treated. Uh, we know that we are safe, we are efficacious, and we have a long term uh, follow up in most of those patients. Uh, what I mean by safety? Well, as was shown by PAF study, uh, we are between uh, six or, or seven percent of morbid mortality, and most important, we are very efficacious. We have more than ninety percent of occlusion at six months and one year. So uh, I think uh, we learn a lot. We learn that we can treat uh, the same patient with three, uh, three, three complex aneurysms, uh, both cavernous sinus, one dissection in the right vert, were treated with three uh, three devices, as you can see there. And this is a six-year follow-up showing again uh, the durability of the of, of the of the method, uh, which is sent to publication. Our experience, the thin year of, of pipeline, uh, one thousand uh, aneurysms were treated. We using more than one pipeline, of course. The average one one point twenty one. Uh, one third of those thirty five percent were large or giants, and we call those. Uh, uh, we call those complex. Uh, 84 of our series was, was sacular itself, like, like those. Um, uh, but what happened with, if we count the more the mortality of, of, of that particular group, group of giant on complex, we have almost threefold morbid mortality. That's why I call those really complex. Uh, we start at the beginning with the very proximal, uh, proximal uh, aneurysm at the level of the cavernous sinus. Uh, the ophthalmic segment, but we went on after and went and reached some distal examples. So this is the, the beginning, uh, three, three, three of those cases, and after we went uh, a little bit more distal. Regarding the, the ophthalmic uh, uh, segment, I think uh, this is a case with a young lady, 50-year-old uh, lady with uh, complex aneurysm on the ophthalmic uh, segment. This is pre-treatment 2D. And this is the way that it shrinks one month, six months, and this is almost four years showing again uh, the remodeling, nice remodeling of the RT. Um, this is another, another lady with a similar one with the right amaurosis uh, already installed. And this is two year follow up showing uh, the remodeling of the RT. So what are our limitations? Because we have limitation on those, on those giant and complex aneurysms. The main limitation is to find the exit. Sometimes we have to look 360 inside of the aneurysm to reach the exit. Sometimes we have to do a double loop, uh, try to reach uh, the MCA to anchor our guy wear all the way uh, down. Sometimes we have to use balloon to straight up our guy were inside of the uh, and the micro catheter inside of the aneurysm, or sometimes we sometimes we have to anchor with um, with uh, with a uh, uh, stand even. So this is another lady that she was blind from the right side. Uh, uh, was sorry was 
blind from the left side, but get, get going blindness also on the right side. Uh, that you see the mass effect, what, everything was compressed on, on the left, there was no, no blood coming from, from that side uh, due to this giant hyperficial aneurysm. Uh, so this is the fusion over, 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 over impulsion with MRI and DSA in one single screen. So it was very difficult to manage. I tried everything. I tried the septal proximal. I couldn't, I couldn't pass and find the exit. Finally, I succeed with two wires. I put the first wire very distal on the left MCA, and the, the second wire was the ACA. So using that, I tracked my marksman catheter at that time, and I was able to construct three, um, three telescopic uh, pipeline from, from distal uh, to proximal, as you can see there. This is the immediate result with some vasos paps on the left, uh, on the right MCA, uh, but the analysis was, was occluded. Uh, this is, uh, as soon as I released the catheter, everything was, was, uh, was okay there. Uh, so this is four months follow up. You see how diminish the, the mass effect on, on the left. Uh, this is one year follow up showing the reconstruction of the, of the artery. So this is another uh, little bit more, more distal with a severe mass effect. Um, you can see the MRI, the two, two, two axial view, uh, flare axial also. Uh, this is immediately one year follow up showing the shrinkage and the release of the mass effect of this aneurysm. Uh, DSA and 3D showing before and after the complete remodeling of, of the artery. And this is again uh, showing how nice we release the mass effect. She was a bailarina actually on the on the on the on the ballet, on the classic ballet in Buenos Aires. A little bit more distal uh, and anterior again with the giant severe mass effect, as you see, you can see here, better seen in the probably in the in the in the sagittal view, uh, severe mass effect. So I bridge from A1 on the right to A2 on the left. Uh, with one single device, uh, she was uh, she has already a left thamaurosis, uh, of course, was giant uh, partial thrombosis. So you will see the release of the release of the same effect, uh, and also the occlusion of the of the um, of the aneurysm. Please pay attention how we change the geometry of the of the artery over the time. And this is uh, again almost three years follow up, showing nice. Uh, nice remodeling of the artery that was confirmed on cross-sectional image. I always do cross-sectional image on those um, either by CT or you know, most frequent by MRI. So I am I, I trying to illustrate the limitation. Uh, the axis and the exit are one. Uh, sometimes the shortening of the device, if we unship too much the, the, our devices, there is a shortening and you, you have a bridge disruption as I will show you. Uh, you see, you unsheet too much, you must pull and push, try to really compress nicely the device against the, the, the wall of the, of the, and you need more than one device, clearly. You need two or three sometimes. If not, you will have that kind of problem. Uh, so I was very happy here. I make a construction uh, from the MCA all the way down. I put four, four, um, four devices. I try to uh, to accommodate between the bridge between the, the second and the third, and unfortunately, I rupture my construction. So what the, what you can do in that uh, setting, uh, I put um, I, I was able to insert uh, an, an alligator and pull the distal two inside of the aneurysm. I can I can show you that's why those are the 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 distal two, and I was able to reconstruct again from the ACA all the way to the MCA. Um, so this is before, and this is after showing the release of, uh, of, of the mass effect in only one year, and the same thing you will see on, on DSA and 2D. Uh, another limitation that we have, and I think we have to comment that, and we already published that, is the, the if you have a stent that was previously implanted, uh, you, you can have an endolip because uh, the brave stent or the laser cut stent sometimes it didn't oppose it nicely against the wall. So if you if you think you to put a, a, a device in device, please pay attention and follow carefully those uh, those patients. And of course we have complication. 
uh, we have a we have complication. I show you a couple of uh, of couple of severe. Uh, the the first complication that you can have is a bleeding after you insert the the flow diverter. You can have a hyperacute bleeding, and those are mostly related to the wall injury by by dissection. I will show you one case because you elevate suddenly the, the gradient inside of the area. But you also you can have acute uh, acute bleeding due to mechanical manipulation with drivers and catheters. Subacute, you start to you start to getting now the, the breakdown, uh, the clot breakdown and, and some uh, cytokines inside of the clot. Uh, and of course, we, we had also chronic one uh, until one month due to the inflammatory reaction um, inside of that. On, on top of that, you have a patient with uh, severe anti-aggregation. So this is one of the, of the hyperacute bleeding that I would like to, to show you. Uh, she was a lady with uh, that giant complex um, uh, ophthalmic uh, aneurysm. As you can see there, I was able to insert one device, nicely seen on comb beam CT and any single plane. We were very happy. So we decided to do the last uh, run, uh, the last run before we finished the, the procedure and send the patient to ICU. And suddenly you see the bleeding uh, that occurs during the last angiography. Uh, the, the bleeding comes from the posterior part of the of the of the aneurysm, as you can see there. So this was the our my first uh, bleeding. We published that back in 2011, uh, and AGNR. Uh, we thought that was relating mostly to the change of geometry to increase on pressure. But why those aneurysms bled after flow, diver flow diversion delivery? Well, there are two mechanisms uh, that's proposed by by AJ Wakalo. I think one are the hemodynamic mechanisms, and the second is the intraneurysmal thrombosis uh, created by flow reduction. We release inflammatory, uh, inflammatory markers, cytokines, and we can break down the wall. I think this is important. Uh, what we can do to help in that situation? Well, we try everything, believe me. Uh, we add uh, some coils. Uh, uh, we have more than one flow diverter. Sometimes I, I deliver even five flow diverter. But I think the questions that we have to keep in control of the blood pressure of the patient is very important and do our best anti test. I think this is very important. This is very unusual situation, less than 1% of the patient, but what happened is very uh, unfortunately for, a, uh, for the patient is 100%. So the, the, I think uh, the pre-treatment planning is very important for, for flow diverter. Uh, have a look on the patient, what kind of animals you have, but also what, kind, what device are you going to use. And don't remember, remember you must follow up those patients. Uh, the control of blood pressure for us is very important, not only in the ICU, but only, also when the patient went out of, of the clinic. Uh, the steroid, just a comment of the steroid therapy, I think are important. If the patient has symptoms prior to the treatment, we have steroids for one month. Uh, if the patient worsens symptoms after we place in flow diverter, we have solo model pulse three or five days, and after we keep the patient on steroids for, for one month. Uh, I think the, the, the wall enhancement is something in, uh, special. We pay a lot of attention, has been shown that the, the steroids decrease as you see, the, the inflammation of, of the wall. So we keep a lot of uh, an eye on that. Uh, if we have inflammatory reaction, we add coils or put more flow diverters. If we don't have inflammatory reaction before, prior to the treatment, we just insert flow diverter. Uh, I think for us, uh, antiplatelets uh, are, are very important. We, we are using prasugrel since five years now. We're loading the patients a week before with 60 milligrams, uh, we are using not very, uh, it's very rare, seldom tight aggregate. Uh, when we treat patients in acute and we have to anti uh, aggregate things, we are using tirofibran or agrastat. Uh, what we learn, we, we, we learn that we need something new. We need to really um, uh, some kind of technology with some have a surface treatment. Uh, so, shield technology is the first one that came now three years. We are using in Buenos Aires. Um, uh, it's a metronic de device, and HPC is another coating comes from from Phenox. From Phenox, uh, the aiming try to 
uh, they, 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 they have less platelets, as you hear here, few platelets uh, in HPC2. Uh, um, so blocks early thrombocyte addition on, on, on devices. Very, very, uh, very, I, I have done a couple of cases only with uh, a mono antigregation. I still do using dual antigregation, but in some bleedings, I did use aspirin, pay attention that there are multiple medical interaction with, uh, if, with aspirin if you are using like a monogregation. Uh, the stress, the fever, and a lot of medication can, especially the hypoprofen and metanisol, uh, can do a, a, a really a problem for, for you. This is uh, one of the cases that they did only with aspirin. Uh, as a dissecting uh, A1 anomalies, I implanted the shunt uh, before we treat endovascularly. Um, so that's the shunt was already implanted. I was able to put a very small, um, it's called P P48. Uh, so this is immediately immediately after, and I, this is follow up nine months. You see very nice reconstruction and it's keeping an eight, 18 months now uh, and the patient is okay. Another bad complication that I would like to share with you is um, we were very happy at the beginning, but uh, ended very, very badly. Uh, this is a 45 year old male uh, drug abuser. She, he already uh, got the visual loss due to the right uh, giant of Um uh, So it was very difficult to cross and find the exit. Uh, we, we did it finally. We implant first the enterprise like a bridge, a long enterprise. And inside of the enterprise, we bridge with a long uh, pipeline, as you can see there. So that was nice, a lip sign. Uh, we were very happy with, uh, with the results. Uh, the analysis uh, really uh, showed that it was completely uh, was completely occluded. Uh, so we did the one year follow up. Everything looks great. Uh, the patient uh, decided by himself stop the stop the prasugrel, keep keep himself only on on aspirin, and did a big party. And the party uh, with drugs and whatsoever. He did a, a dissection on on the right uh, on the right uh, artery. Did a stroke, and this is the way that he came to us. Uh, the next day of uh, the same day of the stroke, actually. Uh, so we, we cross with the micro catheter. Uh, we were able to reopen the, the device with uh, with tirofiban, with the intra arterial tirofiban. Here is uh, five minutes, 10 and 15 minutes showing how we open the circulation. Uh, but I, at that time, we did a big mistake because we saw uh, some clots. We were uh, out of the doses of tirofiban. So we decided just to insert to inject intra arterial 10 milligrams of, um, of RTPI to clean those, those clots at that level. Uh, and of course, we clean the clots, uh, but uh, the analyst bled, as you can see here, start to bleeding from, from, from the thrombus that was previously inside of the analyst. Uh, so we finish badly with, uh, with, that, uh, with that case, with that complication. So we we have we still 13 years after we don't understand clearly the healing mechanism and the thrombosis in the inside of the of the analyst. I think we have to we have to work on that. We have to speed up our endothelialization. This is important. Not only uh, uh, have a nice mono integration, but especially we need to increase the speed of the endothelialization. So in conclusion, I think the giant and complex uh, are uh, one is, is, are very challenging um, for for both of us. Uh, we have risk and complication, as we I show you already. I think the therapeutic approach of deletion requires really a, a nice understanding because they have a unique anatomy and also some uh, hemodynamic feature. Um, so I think the numerous challenging issues remain to be solved in, in the treatment of those uh, complex intracranial aneurysms. Uh, I believe that we did our best effort, and I hope I um, I, uh, I finish on time. Uh, we will be having this topic in our next next national minute. Uh, you are cordially invited, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you very much for your. Fantastic presentation. Any comments? Any comment or to the to the case of Pedro Lilic? 
in the audience. Mm. Excuse me. May I? Dr. Bai. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and dear Professor Lilik, thanks for your excellent lecture and uh, very, <laughs> very uh, brilliant PBT. <laughs> Um, I have two questions about the technical nuances. Uh, one is, uh, uh, as we know, uh, many patients with uh, giant intracranial aneurysm combined with uh, parent artery stenosis, especially somewhere adjacent to aneurysm and neck. So what time and uh, and how you deal with ta ta targeting with targeting at the stenosis. Uh, the second question is: uh, I learn a lot from your experience of fluid water use in anterior circulation. Any, any, excuse me. Any experience of fluid water use in posterior circulation? Thank you. Well, yes, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your questions. Really, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, we, we see, as you say, as you pointed out, we see frequently stenosis, uh, either proximal, sometimes even distal. I think this is due to the, to the flow. I mean, the hemodynamics and the flow really impacts, and there is some hyperplasia there, uh, probably. Uh, you know, uh, I was very, at the beginning, in my experience, I was very prone to use balloons and, and try to fix that uh, after, we, after we implanted the, the device. I, was try, I always tried to fix that, that uh, stenosis uh, until I had the first, the, the, my second bleeding, actually. When we had the second bleeding, we sent all the information for the CVD. And it turned out that when, when we opened that stenosis, we increased the resistance uh, distally and, and we increase the flow. Uh, and there are some papers now on by, by Juan Sebral on CFD and George Mason University showing there is some reverse of distal flow that can uh, explain some of the bleedings that we have in those cases. So today, if I see if I see the stenosis, I will not try to open 100%. If this is a very thigh stenosis, I just under the late. Uh, uh, a bit with, with balloon, but I am not going for a hundred percent of dilatation because it, that can be a, a big, a big problem. Regarding the, the, the second questions, we have uh, most of the 80% of, of our series are anterior circulation. Most, of course, more proximal than distal, but we do have experience in the posterior circulation and reconstruction the posterior circulation. I must tell you that uh, it works better in the, in the section, in the second aneurysm. Uh, it didn't work very nicely on those fusiform ectasic, dolly ectasic aneurysm, uh, because, you know, uh, usually it's very late. The patient comes with uh, 9, 10, 11, 12 nerves uh, to, 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 our, to our health, and we, we can help very much on, on those cases. But in, in, in the dissecting aneurysm and the sacral aneurysm, yes, we do have experience and we have a, a good experience uh, on that. I, I, I didn't show because, you know, we were very constrained to the anterior circulation, but we, we, we have experience, yes, in posterior circulation. Okay, excuse me, Mohammed Helmi has a question. Doctor, I'd like to know your endovascular manage, management strategy for CBS patients with a critical clinical condition. Sorry. Okay, I'd like to know your endovascular management strategy for CBS patients with critical clinical condition. Well, we uh, yes, we, we usually most of most of the series are are, are unruptured aneurysm. We were very conservative for uh, for acute bleedings on, on the use of flow diversion. We, for the acute bleedings, we are using more, of course, coiling, uh, coiling and balloon assistant technology. Uh, for uh, for unrupture, we are using, as I pointed out at the beginning of the talk, for rupture, it's clear that we are still using coils and especially balloon assisting coils. But we we did some uh, some very ill patient with, especially with blister-like 
aneurysm. So for blister-like aneurysm with severe bleeding that we treat on, on, on day two, on day three, sometimes we use uh, a mono aggregation in very selective cases with uh, with um, with coated uh, with either by uh, with coated flow diverter either by metronic like a shield or HPC. Uh, we use uh, we the, the question that you have to manage very carefully. If we use only aspirin, you have to use sometimes uh, three times the doses, the normal doses, because uh, uh, some of those patients has fever. Uh, if you use only 500 milligrams uh, IV, uh, that it, you, you will not have really a, a, a nice anti-aggregation. For, so for those cases, we are using uh, uh, either shield or uh, HPC. Okay. Okay, Lois. Okay. Uh, one one question, Pedro. Why when do you like to to place inside the sac the coil previous to deploy the the flow diverter? Well, this is a this is a tough question, as you know. Uh, you know. Uh, as you saw, many of those cases that I did, I haven't used the, I haven't used um, um, coils because I, I really thought that we have to reconstruct the, the artery. But after the, after the bleeding, the, the first and the second bleeding that we have, we start to use it. When I'm using now, what I see wall enhancement on MRI. We're doing very uh, always. We do MRI before we we do our our cases. What we have. Uh, are really a wall enhancement. That means we have an inflammatory reaction at the level of the wall. We add some coils. How many coils? Well, the, there is, uh, we, we have bleeding even with coils. Uh, so uh, I, I try to put uh, uh, coils. I am not packed very, very, very densely because uh, if I pack very densely, I can increase the mass effect, as you know. So there's a compromise between using coils or not using coils. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm I am still convinced that we need to reconstruct the artery with no coils. But uh, because we had that those complications, when we have inflammatory markers, we we use coils. Uh, Luis, probably is is also your experience. Okay, thank you, Pedro. I think now the the next presentation. May I ask one question? To ah, Pedro? okay, okay. Sorry. How are you organizing your follow up study? This is uh, certainly always difficult in the bigger countries. In Finland, we could manage very well, but I know after traveling around the world, in Latin America, USA, China, Russia, it is very difficult to organize the follow-up, 100% of all the patients. Please tell me about the follow-up. Yes, Professor, it's a honor that answer your question for me. Uh, so it's, uh, as you said, it's difficult, but for us, it's mandatory. You know, all those new techniques has has to have follow-ups. I mean, to, to you know, the durability of, of the of the new techniques are always a question. So we have to show our follow-ups. At the beginning, our follow-up was three months, six months, uh, and nine months, and a year. Our ethic committee asked for that. Uh, so now we are using one year follow-up. And, and do yearly until five years. Uh, for those patients that reach more than five years, 10 years, we, 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 we do again at 10 years. But I must tell you that today we are using more and more MRA uh, rather than DSA. Uh, but the, the follow-up, as you mentioned, as you pointed out, and I learned from you also, it is very important. I, I, even in Latin America, we need, when we do the consent of the patient, uh, we, we try to point it that very clearly to the patient and the family that we need uh, the follow-up of those patients. And of course, it's difficult everywhere and it's, it's difficult also in Latin America and especially in Argentina due to the several uh, reason, reasons. So um, sometimes the patient comes to us from more than 2,000, 3,000 kilometers or from another country, but we, we were able to manage, uh, to manage that nicely, I think. I think the follow-up is something essential for, for everybody. And for us, because every time we have new tools, new devices, new, new develops, uh, we have to prove uh, the durability of, of, the, uh, of the treatment, uh, as, as you know. Thank you for the question. Thank you. OK, 
Okay, Lewis. Okay.